guys, and welcome to another one of our Dissecting Horror Panels. Uh, at Dread Central, we've been trying to keep 2020 a little bit positive, which seems to be impossible most of the time, but we try to keep a lot of uh, you viewers, readers entertained with these Dissecting Horror Panels, uh, whether it's reunions, Q&As, or just conversations in general, and I am so excited about this one. Uh, we've partner up, partnered up with White Bear PR to bring you a panel on film scoring for horror. Uh, and we have an excellent panel, one that I'm very excited about. And uh, if I haven't told you already, my name is Jerry Smith, writer for Dread Central. So let's just jump on in. Uh, first off, we have Colin Stetson, who scored the amazing Ari Aster film Hereditary and another personal favorite of mine, Color Out of Space by Richard Stanley. Colin, how's it going, man? Going very well. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming. And next up, we have Trevor Gorekis, who is the composer for the M. Night Shyamalan show, Servant, and uh, another one that I really enjoy, the Blumhouse film, Bloodline. How's it going, Trevor? Uh, it's great. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. Uh, next up, uh, the composer of Evil Eye, which is another really great recent film that you can catch on Amazon Prime right now, and also the just enthralling series, Sinner. We have uh, Ronit Kirchman. Hi, thanks for having me. Definitely. And last but not least, we have the composer of Becky, Girl in the Photographs, and my favorite film of the year so far, Alone, uh, Nima Fakara. What's up, man? Thanks for having me, man. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Oh, great. So anyways, jumping right in, uh, start with kind of an icebreaker thing. So when I was seven years old, I went through some very traumatic stuff as a kid. And to cope with it and to get me away from the traumatic stuff, my mother put me in a movie theater that we lived next door to from when she would go to work until she would get off work. I would spend every day of that summer and a couple other months just in the theater all day. As a seven-year-old, and this is pre-Columbine, so nobody carded anyone, saw movies I should not have seen at that age. <laughs> sitting, there one, sitting there one day, I stumbled across a movie that I had no idea what it was. Uh, it just said Halloween in four. So as a seven-year-old by myself, I watched this movie and it scared the living shit out of me at that age. Uh, it was so enthralling and it just made me fall in love with the horror genre. But not only that, one of the things that really just transported me into that film was the opening credit sequence and Alan Howard's score. Uh, the music made that movie for me. Uh, and to be honest, Halloween's my favorite film of all time, the John Carpenter film, but I don't think I would love it if there were like, you know, kazoos playing when Michael Myers jumped over the station wagon. You know, I and that series in particular kickstarted this lifelong love of film scores for me. Uh, it was such a transformative and monumental moment in my life. So I'm curious, and this is a question for all of you, was there a particular film that made you want to do what you do? Or did you fall into it a different way? Uh, Colin, do you want to start out? Um, in general, uh, early on childhood, I would say probably, you know, Star Wars um, Empire um, in terms of horror poltergeist. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely, like this, uh, yeah, that one was, was it for me. Um, more modern the thing that I think the two films maybe the three that that really made me because I've been you know working at, you know in all different capacities of, as a musician with rock bands and as a solo artist for years before I started scoring but the things that uh, brought me into it were um, Zimmer's score to Thin Red Line, um, Johan's score um, for Prisoners and um, and Johnny's for um, There Will Be Blood. Mm -hmm. um, that's, yeah, that was kind of, that's what, you know, provided me the motivation and inspiration to, um, to, to, to step into this arena. Yeah, definitely. I, I think any score for like any Villanueva film is just, yeah, yeah, Prisoner's yeah. great. Yeah, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, no. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I would just say, uh, Trevor, what about you, man? Um, you know, my background is actually very like classical uh, composer. I uh, mm -hmm. studied classical composition in undergrad and grad school. So I very much had in my mind the track of like 
orchestral and opera and yeah that was uh that was what my plan was <laughs> at the same time it was very i was really open and uh a lot of you know music by john williams and um and alexander desplat and uh um so like very orchestral mind or you know concept uh, composers mm -hmm. um but uh, then I was working for Philip Glass for a little bit, for a few years. So I learned a lot about film scoring uh, with him. And, you know, in doing that, I was, you know, able to see like kind of the behind the scenes about film scoring and, and that whole process and learning more and seeing how, you know, as a composer, you can really make a living doing that. Mm -hmm. So find as a, coming from the mindset of a classical, composer, you could find a long form route to create, to, you know, create uh, interesting ideas that have themes across multiple, you know, uh, the entire film or across the entire series. And, you know, it's really similar in that way to some of the stuff that I was uh, so obsessed about with Shostakovich, for instance, or something, you know? Not so totally. that way it kind of like, um, was a little bit full circle with some of the composers of classical and film. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, Rooney? Um, well, it's such a, it's a, such, such a great question that makes me have uh, probably too many answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, you know, there are a few threads. Um, one is just a, a real response to uh, a cinematic aesthetic which can mean so many different things. Um, not Definitely not limited to just dark material or horror. Um, there are certain, and it's interesting, some of those films are, um, you know, smaller budget European films like the Red, White, Blue trilogy really mm -hmm. um, impacted me a lot. Uh, and it, it, I'm kind of, kind of fascinated by how that, uh, the synesthetic experience of how things are put together in those films gives you a feeling of expanse. Um, so, Similarly to, you know, uh, everybody has been talking about John Williams, like even something a little bit more um, uh, innocent, like E.T., um, mm -hmm. those experiences of wonder. I think um, I, I had that response to films, not necessarily solely just because of the music, but because of the kind of everything together sense of my heart and mind opening. Um, so I think that in terms of why film, uh, I feel like that's kind of why I've ended up in this space. I, I love stuff that kind of takes you beyond your um, envelope. Um, I worked a lot in theater in New York before I moved out to LA and um, I, I trended toward really immersive theater. And, you know, to be honest, there's not that much of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I, I thought the cinematic space offers kind of what I'm looking to help create. Um, and then, you know, composers wise, I feel like um, Jerry Goldsmith is a great example of somebody with amazing taste. And like he uh, also didn't really announce it when he was doing something incredibly innovative. Like I love the alien score. It's like that yeah. opening is perfect. And it's so um, timelessly uh, forward thinking. Um, so things like that, which kind of, uh, I think are new and original in a way that isn't just like trendy or uh, it's kind of like, it almost stands outside the time space continuum in a way. Um, uh, and um, I'm trying to think what else. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, um, I, I really love Baz Luhrmann's, um, you know, Moulin Rouge, Romeo and Juliet. Remember when those came out, I was like, yes, <laughs> you know, you can mm -hmm. kind of put together something that's, and I think that's the theatrical impulse too, of like having a heightened vocabulary that even though it's quite postmodern, it's putting together disparate elements. It has a real signature that is completely original um, and on a sensory level really draws you in and the music is really central to that and integrates song and score, which is another thing that I'm really passionate about. So no, I totally. could go on, but those are a few things. You know, it's it's funny that you mentioned uh, you know, Romeo. I had all these friends that were talking about the two different soundtracks that came out, like all these songs 
And that was great. But I remember being so locked into just the score part of that film that, you know, it's it's like people didn't understand that, you know, like my, my dad would always ask me, well, where do you spend your allowance on like the Jurassic Park soundtrack, like, or the Terminator 2 soundtrack, it doesn't even have the Guns N' Roses song on it, you know, and it's just like, it's an experience, you know, it, it's, you leave the theater with this experience that it's not just the story that you told, like that you just watched, but the music helps tell that story so well. Definitely. Uh, Nima, what about yourself? Uh, well, I had a, a bit of a different unconventional route to Hollywood, if you will. Uh, I grew up playing Persian classical music in Iran. Uh, so mm -hmm. for me to the understanding of film and film scoring kind of came very late for me. Um, but uh, I've always been a film buff my entire life, even when they would bring over with, in basically suitcases of DVDs, uh, illegal movies, uh, and you would be able to kind of watch them and just VHSs used to be. Um, and mm -hmm. I remember uh, my first ever kind of score that I ever listened to was Professional. Um, oh, uh, and that was, that was one of the biggest ones that kind of just kind of triggered something for me. But once I moved to the U.S., uh, because I grew up playing Persian classical music, I always kind of reached for those ideas. Um, and Black Hawk Down was a score that kind of changed my world a little bit, seeing how electronic, orchestra, uh, ethnic music, just different genres of things were kind of just being played with. Uh, but but uh, for me, it's been Zimmer, kind of uh, Bernard Herrmann, Michael Kamen, um, the the most kind of composers that have been chameleons. You see mm -hmm. them doing multiple genres. You see them uh, going with the filmmakers and just doing multiple things. And you can't pinpoint like Hans what kind of a composer he is. He could do a comedy like nobody's business, and then he could do a action score right away, kind of very similar to. Uh, Bernard Herrmann is this very similar type of a composer. So those are the guys that I've always kind of just reached out for and just kind of listened to and kind of influenced me. I've, I mean, I've always been the outside of the box guy. So mm -hmm. for me, it's the weirdness. It's the it's um, it's the unconventions. Um, love Johnny Greenwood. When somebody steps out of the box and does something completely different that no one expects, it just it's amazing. It's so refreshing to hear. No, totally. Uh, a recent example that that happened to me was uh, Chino Moreno from the band Deftones scored one of the Blumhouse uh, Hulu movies. And I was watching mm -hmm. that and I was like, that is something I would not expect, but it works perfectly. Yeah. I was going to say that um, it really matters uh, what, what facilitates those moments of breakthrough, I think, are really... Um, Kind of that support from the director uh, and or producers, both really the willingness and interest in going somewhere new. So I always remind myself when I'm watching a new film or series that, you know, it's like those of us who've gone through lots of different sorts of collaborations, sometimes you have a really free hand. And um, I think all of us here, <laughs> from what I've heard, it's like there's a, a real desire to express something exciting and new. And then it's like you can do, uh, you try to pour that into the container that you, uh, of the story, not just the story, but the, the willingness of the collaborators on a particular show. So. Very well um, put. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, Nima, you spoke on kind of like the, the chameleon composers are the ones that stand out to you. Uh, one thing that I've noticed about all of your work is how all of you kind of have that that aesthetic to your work. Uh, you know, Colin, if you listen to the Hereditary score and then you listen to The Color Out of Space, those two films could not be any more different. But and it, it shows it shows how you know being across all across the board you are. But at the same time. I, if I didn't know that you had done both of those films and someone told me, I wouldn't be surprised. So I feel like there's that chameleon thing, but at the same time, I feel like each of you have your own particular stamp on the films that you do. Do, do any of you feel like that's kind of an important thing to do as well? I, I have a, a bit of a crisscross on this one um, because for me personally, I, I, I really, I try very hard to keep, to stay out of, to keep 
like my my presence out mm -hmm. i don't i mean, with with hereditary especially i mean it was any time i felt like i showed up on screen like if i saw myself pop out i just i nixed whatever you know there's so much that fell that that's on the cutting room floor for hereditary um just because it was just too it became too present um and uh and too and, and I, yeah, again, I, I, I found, I found myself in it. Um, and, uh, and so I try to do that. And yet I think that because of the way, the nature of how I do, how I, I tend to work, which is, you know, hereditary, I played every instrument on that score. Um, I mixed, I recorded and mixed the whole thing um, for Color of Space. The only thing I didn't play is the strings. Um, and uh, and again, recorded and mixed it all. And so I just by nature of the fact that I'm doing most of it, and there's this through lines of the way that I that I played various instruments, it tend, you know, I, the, the me is imprinted in it, regardless of how much I might try to, um, to um, assuage that. But um, yeah, I, I, I feel like it's, it's a it's, or at least to me, it's an important um, goal at least to try to minimize one's um one's ego's presence um in in, in the score and to, and to try not to hide but to try to support um the storytelling to the greatest degree and and, and I, I think that when for me um with a score what takes me out the most is if someone, you, when, and we've all experienced it when we were watching film and somebody just heavy hands something and mm -hmm. throws the theme around with a little bit too much swagger <laughs> and a little bit too much, too many um, uh, uh, repetitions and, and variations. And, um, and <laughs> you just, just feel like um, you've, you, they knew that that wasn't right. <laughs> they knew that they were, that they were, that they were taking attention off of what the the you know the the experience of the um of the audience shouldn't have been with them it should have been with the um uh, with the picture um so yeah uh, i think it's i think it's a lot like being um an actor you know you're you're an actor who gets to write musical text too obviously but there's something about um and no matter what you do, you're in your body, right? So if you think yeah. of your body as an, ext an extended thing that, that includes your brain and how you um, uh, come up with things creatively, um, I think that analogy really holds. And I, when I um, start to work on a film, I often um, you know, use techniques that actors use in terms of immersing myself in the world and allowing myself to transform um, you know, uh, and become part of that landscape. So I think whatever, no matter what you do, you can trust that you, um, that stamp is going to um, create itself. What's exciting about it, I think, is that you discover uh, parts of yourself that were dormant uh, or unexplored that you wouldn't have um, known either musically or emotionally, tonally, um, uh, even interpersonally, you know, that the story and the collaboration brings out. So you actually get to, just like actors do, you get to kind of, your instrument gets uh, expanded and seasoned and um, you add colors to your palette just by virtue of doing your job well, hopefully. <laughs> um, and I think that that's what's addictive about it is that, uh, you know, it is you, um, but it it's, you have help from this very living world to uh, enliven and awaken parts of yourself that weren't conscious and they become they come to the surface because when you're writing music it's it's right on the border and at some point especially if you're you if you are working with anybody uh, else in any capacity you have to um, make sense in whatever language you're speaking <laughs> so you know you have to bring that uh, subliminal material to the surface. And I think that that's, that's kind of like the definition of evolution on a psychological level. So we're lucky that that's kind of a necessity of the job description. Absolutely. I, I, I love the, the problem solving um, element to the, to the, the whole endeavor. 
everything just seeing each um each new story each new score as a as a new, unique set of of problems um with which to yeah. find unique I mean, hopefully novel so solutions for sometimes like i um i even like uh think about what the previous score was and um, think about, you know, next time I would love to do something new. <laughs> you know, so like I, uh, I did like this film, The Goldfinch, and it's like this big epic Hollywood score. And then the next thing I did was Servant, which was like, I like played all the instruments and learned violin and it was like much smaller. That and was that's you. exactly what I told myself. So I was like, when right way back when I finished the Goldfinch, I was like, oh, you know what, I should really, I just would love to do something much smaller and just like play all the instruments. And that was just sort of like happened to work out and not, you know, I just kind of like got to the place where that made sense. It wasn't like I imposed that idea, but it was like also kind of in the back of my head that like part of my experience as a composer was like trying to go in this direction of getting off the grid playing more instruments myself, mixing it, you know what I mean? Like you're kind of learning more about composing, about being an instrumentalist, about mm -hmm. the whole experience of living as a musician. So um, that's, you know, it's all with, again, as we all have already said, we're kind of within the box of, of someone else's greater vision, but um, you know, we have like our little window <laughs> that we're allowed to look out as well. <laughs> you know, a film has so many components to make it work. Uh, you have to w put this kind of stew of so many ingredients. You know, it's, it's not just a visual thing, but an audio aspect too. You know, I've seen great films or great stories be brought down by like just really overindulgent scores or films or stories that like were just okay but you would just enjoy them so much because the score is just so good and you resonate with it. You know, when you get it right, the combination I think is untouchable and it almost transcends the film in a way. Earlier today, I took a walk to the store about 10 minutes away and I was listening to Colin's score for Hereditary. And it was the most mundane, boring walk until I pushed, until I hit play on my phone. And it was that party crash cue you know that is the big one of the big moments of the movie and it turned a normal mundane walk into one of the most stressful walks of my entire life you know I was looking at all <laughs> the cars I was looking at all the cars just like you know and I, I feel like you know the the approach that you had on that film Colin it, it almost acts like another character and that's another thing that I've noticed about every one of your work they, your scores act like characters. I mean, Nima, your score for Becky, that film is very much about just the anger the kids can have, you know, these, this unchecked anger and pain that they go through, that so many kids go through, and they're put in the, and she's put in this really horrific situation, and the anger just blows, you know? Your score acts as, as, as if it's another character. Or mm -hmm. Trevor, Trevor and Ronit, I mean, Trevor, Servant, and Ronit, Sinner, both scores, I mean, they, it, they're they subtle when they need to be, and they're just very poetic when they need to be as well. I, I'm curious, when it comes to the collaboration with all of your collaborators in, in those films, uh, you know, Colin Ariaster or the genius that is Richard Stanley, how do you know when to kind of scale back what you want to do with the film you know, and kind of get this united kind of vision for the movies. Um, for, for me, working with directors um, is, I, I approach it the same way as I always approached working with, um, with other artists. You know, I've worked with um, lots of different singer songwriters um, over the years and, and different uh, bands. And, you know, when you're working with a, song, a songwriter, Again, the, the approach was don't don't lead with what what you know you're, you're not here to put your stamp on this. You're not here to like to lay down like just you know lay down a fat solo that makes sure that you know that's just basically a tag. Um, mm -hmm. 
you just you analyze the the song you, you will you first see what it is that they envision for it you see for in your own intuitions what it is that you think um, is missing and what functionally it's is, ne is needed and then and then try to figure out how you can best um, supply that as like leanly as possible and so that's the thing with you know with scoring for for me going with with Ari that was that was ideal to such a degree that I don't think I will ever have exactly that um, an experience um, to 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 its like. Um, Ari called me, um, I think three years before we uh, we started. I think we wow. three years before we started working on it, um, and said, "I've got this script. I would I've been I've been writing it to your music, and I would love it if you'd um, consider uh, scoring it." And so I read the script and then immediately called him back. I was like, yes. <laughs> and really he had, you know, the, the, the moment you, you were just talking about, Jerry, um, in the script, you're just like, okay, I don't even need to read on. This mm -hmm. is, because and another thing about that script, it reads exactly how you saw it. It was and this, back years ago. It really did not change at all. It was, it was, it was perfect. Um, and so, uh, he you know so we went kind of back and forth over the co course of a few years i'd hear from him every you know eight months to a year or so just saying like still working on it tell you when we when we get more and then um and then so he told me i think it was just over a year out of the movie being you know what would be the release date at sundance um that he finally got um funding and he and he and he was casting it and and we had a quick talk about what he envisioned it and he was just like you're the you're the fifth you know character in you're, you're the house you're the you're, you're the fifth member of the family um you're the uh the, the 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 that that thing that's that's been there since before pick you know cameras rolling and is cu the culmination um of you know it, it's the storyline it's the plot that's already been that's been working on for decades and that that ultimately everyone's just embroiled in and has no um no power over um and um, and I said, okay, what do you want it to sound like? And he said, I just want it to sound evil. And that was all he gave <laughs> all he gave me. And I wrote for I wrote and recorded for a month, um, and took all of that music and gave it to him. He used and then that became premier. I mean, most of the temp was that. Um, I ended up writing additional uh, things as it went along. But most of the temp was were the cues that I'd written for him, just off of based off of the script, based off of those descriptions. And um, he was able to then use the music on set with the actors. Um, and uh, I know that Alex Wolf, to get him psyched, to get himself psyched up, was was playing it pretty nonstop before he would um, do takes. And um, so, so yeah, uh, I started writing that score a little over. A year before the movie came out, um, and so it, it was absolutely ideal. Um, and with something like Colorado Space, was almost the exact opposite. We, I came in on the project, um, a, maybe two, two or three months out from it premiering, and so had spent just two weeks gunning down and doing the same sort of thing but okay and i don't have i don't have months to do this to you know to 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 populate um temp but i and also i fucking hate temp i hate like an editor's temp like that just and it, you you, it, you know they're all where they're going to be getting them from <laughs> there's always like these everybody everybody on the panel i'm sure is really sick of hearing um very specific um uh, cues that everybody just uses um that you have to somehow dance around um and um but yeah i won't get into temp love um but uh, so the the idea of getting way out in in way out in front of temp love is like my number one priority in this job and so every chance i can i if if i if i if i'm showing up way in, way, way late in the process i just I, I try to heavy load. I work as much as I can to get as much music written off of script and off of you know wh whatever I have to go on principal photography or whatever. Um, I, uh, I, I I flood the editors and just say use this, um, and then we'll go from there. Uh, and so that and luckily that was the case. We were able to just kind of 
inhabit the the entirety of it with um, with the temp that I wrote and and then um, and, uh, and 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 leave blank much of the other things that that uh, that weren't rather than work from somebody else's temp. How um, much music did you write for Hereditary? Out of curiosity. Hereditary. I was hired for 45 minutes. Hereditary ended up being 88. Um, wow. And uh, same thing for, for Color Out of Space. I was hired for a, an hour and Color ended up being, I think it was around 86 or something like that. It was basically the same. The, the, always. And my favorite thing about Hereditary is that everybody thinks I kept on hearing, oh, it's so great. There's so much silence in the movie. <laughs> there's almost no <laughs> silence. But, it, but there's just a really long uh, bit of silence. There's that 25 minutes after the the moment. Um, and it is a good 25 minutes. It's, a, um, uh, it's like a couple couple reels that there's just nothing. Um, and which is, for me, beautiful to be able to, to work with that kind of a gap. Um, because we don't we don't tend to get <laughs> that <laughs> uh, but yeah i'm i'm hogging no totally you know nima speaking on uh collaborators you know uh you know we both have a mutual friend in nick simon who you before we started this panel you mentioned that you have done every one of his films you know like working with someone that much on every single one of their films does it get easier with time with each project? Is there like an unspoken connection as far as his vision and what you want to do? Or do you still approach every single project with someone like Nick very differently from the previous film? Nick is the hardest person to work with. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, he is, um, I've been lucky enough to have collaborators that um, kind of allow me to do whatever I want to do to a certain limit. Um, Nick is one of those that um, uh, most of his projects, even even the first one that we worked on removal, um, I was uh, I was brought in when he was still finishing up the script. Uh, <laughs> so very similar to Colin, um, I was writing music way before the movie was shot, uh, and I've done that a few times. Uh, with I did it with Crypto, I did it with Becky, I've done it with even Alone. Most of my films I like to get in early because. Um, um, it's it's funny because I, I like to call it that we're just we're just musicians that we're just practicing our concert. Our concert is the score that we're about to put into the picture. So for me, I want to practice and be able to kind of go on stage. So I write big chunks of music, suites of like 20, 30 minutes of music. And it's just my vomit takes of just different ideas. And it becomes my kind of my gig practice. And just when I'm at, in front of the DAW and I'm about to kind of start writing the first note, it's really just performing it, you know? Um, so when I, when I get on a project, especially with kind of like Nick's projects, uh, we've been chatting probably six months before he even probably takes the, uh, take the typewriter over the keyboard and writes the first letter. Um, so we're chatting way before that, even, even for Becky, it was, a um, it was a fun one as well. It was just kind of like I got in very late, but uh, uh, both John and Carrie were just like, hey, do whatever you feel it's right. Um, and that's a very tough task. Uh, do whatever it feels right, especially for a director that they've been spending so much time with the project. And you're supposed to just take it and just run with it. Uh, it's a very dreadful, it's a very hard thing to do. Uh, but I, I like to say that um, I'm a servant to picture or I'm the servant to the story or I'm a slave to picture or whatever it is. Um, so whatever that requires, no matter if it's a single note piano, um, that works. You know, if, if the scene fits that, I'm all about that. I'm not going to go and record a 60 piece orchestra and be like, hey, this is what it needs to be, you know. Um, and sometimes it's just a story that allows you to just do whatever you want to do. Um, so. It's a it's a catch twenty two. It's it's a um, yeah. I completely agree. Sometimes the temp is is a fucker, and you got to deal with it. Uh, but the best part about it is just like that that creativity of hey, how do you deal with that situation, or how do you kind of go away and become somebody else um, and still have your own identity with it? Um, in our world, is a very common problem to have, and the solutions are vast solutions and multiple ways to kind of yeah. solve the problem. 
You know, your your score for alone really stands out when I'm talking about your work because you know you you mentioned wanting to serve the picture and you know Kemp being a fucker at times. Uh, your score for alone is unique in the sense that the the score is separated into specific chapters. Yep. So the score feels very unique on its own. I, I'm curious when dealing with the idea of temps, especially for that film, and the end result being this chapter score, yep. was that something that you discussed with the with uh, you know John? <laughs> Or was that sure. something that you just kind of came up with? So when I was brought onto the movie, uh, they told me they don't want to score. Uh, they literally said, hey, we don't want to score. Uh, we don't want anything, uh, but we're bringing you on. <laughs> so, um, so the challenge was, how do you make music without it being a score? So I worked very closely with the sound designer and the AD and basically dub mixer. Um, so there is a, there's a ton of music that was pulled from the actual sound design. Um, so there's a, there's a track called crash and there in the actual movie, there's a car crash and I took literally the sounds from a car crash and made it into a score. But the, the chapter part about it is that there's these moments. Uh, I mean, the character is, is, a, is setting out a, on a trip from a location to another location, and then she gets basically a stalker going after her, and she gets kidnapped. So there is these moments of kind of realization through her journey that it's kind of the surrealism of the moment. And also there's a nature factor to it too. So that the, the minimalistic kind of very orchestral string driven kind of pieces were that. And then the actual kind of paranoia was this sound design, very heavy uh, sound design kind of score. I mean, there's no temp in the, the score. And it was uh, one of those things that every part of that was a challenge of how do you make music without making music, you know? Um, and it's this fine line of playing with that world. And love doing it so mm -hmm. you know trevor and Roni, you know you've both recently done some excellent score work for for tv series you know with servant and sinner uh do both of you uh, this question is for both of you do you approach a series in a different manner than a feature and if so what are the challenges between the two for you um you want to go? <laughs> sure. We're both going to go sometimes. So. Uh, <laughs> um, I am, um, in, in my view, in a way, uh, it's, uh, it's scalable. Um, so a series is actually, especially if it's a series which has a cinematic uh, aesthetic approach, which mm -hmm. uh, for sure from its inception, like the center, uh, the whole team involved wanted it to uh, feel like a um, cinematic experience, not like um, a typical procedural, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's really kind of like, uh, you know, an eight hour movie instead of a one hour movie um, or a two hour movie. Um, mm -hmm. And what it offers is an exciting, you know, it depends on uh, when you get the scripts. And with every season I had kind of different things in place super early uh, and other things that were um, very compressed. So um, generally, since I um, was working with the showrunner before the season started, I would get scripts and, and we'd get kind of a, a relaxed idea space to start building quite early, which is great. Um, and we get to think about um, palette options um, and that's kind of what allowed me to the first couple seasons, I'm playing absolutely everything from, you know, harmonium to hammered dulcimer to violin. And um, for the third season, I really felt like uh, it kind of was inviting more of a, um, a for one component, one thread of it, uh, a chamber ensemble sound of a very specific kind. It's kind of like a um, multi contrapuntal nonet string nonet um, where everybody has uh, their own pathway through um, and that was um, you know required budgeting um, and having that lead time allowed us to do that it would never have been possible without knowing in advance that we you know because it was not normally a show that had that um, 
you know. Um, and so I think that, um, but then the actual production time is like, you know, I've had to turn around episodes in two days, really important episodes. <laughs> so um, there's a kind of mix of pacing and preparation and lack thereof when you're getting the footage, depending on how the shoot and post are overlapping. So there are times when there's a little room, you can play with it a little more. And then like, you know, the last two thirds of it are often like, you know, really, really tight. Um, so it's interesting that you get kind of a universe of pacing experience, just workflow wise. Um, and um, I'm trying to bring it back around to the original thread. Uh, if you can remind me. <laughs> oh, just the, dif the differences and the challenges between. Oh yeah, a, so yes. you're basically in this place where you can, I think, develop themes. And now like with, we're, we've been renewed for a fourth season, but like from season one to two to three, um, since it is kind of an anthology with continuity, there's this opportunity, not just within each season, but then across seasons to choose, you know, what's going to create the continuity. Like I'm, I'm, I make my job probably harder for myself than I need to, because I'm always selling them on doing like, let's do something really new this season and still have it be part of the world because it's a <laughs> whole new crime. It's a whole new world for the the world, the, the crime is just like what, what provides the continuity is Bill Pullman's character. So finding ways to bring his um, psychic journey through um, these stylistically actually quite um, distinct worlds is really fun as a composer and would never happen in a film. So, um, and sometimes we'll unearth orphans. <laughs> I have a little orphan bin of like, you know, this cue that was never used, but it becomes a theme that's like perfect for season two is just waiting for its moment. So yeah. <laughs> um, it's exciting in that way because actually, uh, I, you know, ironically, it's a place where the artistic development is actually much deeper than um, just because of the nature of how much time you have, how much space you have to develop. So what, what a theme can become is much more. So as a composer, the, the series landscape is super, exciting and and you know in, from an artistic standpoint which i think you know might not be something that people think of you know but it's it's one of those things i think now that we're in this like golden age of tv b2 where people are realizing the artistic uh openings that episodic series provide and and you know when the um kind of budget and willingness to make it uh something special are there then um, it can offer even more depth sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know, I like working on both, but I have to say it, working on short, shorter forms like a film, it feels like a, such a luxury because you, <laughs> you have more time and um, you don't have to do 200 iterations that are each interesting and specific. <laughs> you know, you only have to do 10 or whatever. <laughs> and uh, Trevor? Yeah, I mean, I'm just starting my the second season, or I'm halfway through the second season of Servant right now. But um, my experience has been um, it's it's similar in that you there is there are those kind of like variations of scale, so much time you have between each episode that you have to provide. But yeah, so you, I mean, what what we did was working with night was sort of just first come up with like a, a basic lexicon for what the series was gonna sound like. And I, I proposed sort of this, you know, series of ideas. It was just like one, two, three, four, you know, I just like just up to nine different things, just kept throwing them at him. And I saw just like the first episode, but, um, and it was just like, no, that's not good. That's not the right sound. This isn't the show, this isn't it, or this is kind of it. And then, they would throw it around in different parts and he would never show, he would never use temp music in any, any of the stuff that he would do, which was great because I at least never wanted to hear other things because he knew that it was going to be new. He didn't want to be convinced of anything else. Um, so once we established like something that's completely off picture away from what they had been shooting, then we kind of knew that this was the servant thing then you can kind of move quickly because you're like, all right, this is the instruments that I have. 
they're in my studio. That one's got a mic already set up. You know, <laughs> I can <laughs> right over there with my violin. You know? I kind of know how I can like get at least you know, you know, get the motion going. So, um, and it's definitely like a mad mad rush. You kind of know uh, that you're. It becomes more clear as you're doing it. Um, like I think with a, a movie, you, you you have more of a long view from the beginning. You could see like, oh, this movie's gonna be like this, like all the way, and it's gonna end exactly the way I know. But with the with the series, you're kind of like, I think, like I didn't even see see read the script of the last episode until like like a month before we we were started working on it. So like I didn't even know how the show ended. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, there's an element of like uh, of that that I, I'm sure goes on all the time uh, with series um, because of the you know the twists and turns that they have, they need to hold back for the next year, you know the next season or whatever. Um, but then you start as you were mentioning you start to pile up all these resources. So I've got my symbol performances that are in my catalog and then all my kalimba things and you know so then I can pull that in and so that's been interesting but I did the whole restart um for season two where it was sort of like well within Servant this is you know certainly our universe but let's again take a new look at where this season is going to go which is a new it's new within the world so it's both things um but again I don't even know how it ends <laughs> yeah, you know, my last question, uh, my last question before we get into a, a couple questions for the last few minutes, uh, with 2020 being as, I hate to just use the word wild because I'm trying not to be, a, you know, overly cynical about it, as crazy as it is, you know, the film industry has been just in such turmoil over it. You know, a lot of films aren't being made right now. So I'm, I'm curious uh, to all of you, how's that affected work as composers, you know, uh, uh, you know, doing orchestras and stuff like that. Have you had to think outside of the box or maybe take a different approach than you would have, say, last year? Colin, do you want to start off? Oh, um, it, this whole thing, well, as I said before, I, I don't have a whole, I, I don't, I don't, I usually work alone. I usually provide most, if not all, of the instrumentation myself. I part of this has in the past, although I, although nowadays more and more I'm using I'm using more outside um, instrumentalists. But part of this has always been like a challenge of like I'll I'll specifically think of things that I want to learn just because of the new gig. I'm like, oh, this one is going to force me to learn how to play this and learn how to. How to do this, and um, and so um, in that regard, it hasn't really changed. This year has not changed my workflow really at all. Um, the the people who I tend to work with for outside instrumentation are dear friends and colleagues who I've been working with. Some of them back as long as twenty five, thirty years, um, and so. Uh, they all have their own home studios. So when I need to reach out, if I write, I write them a pile. I send them a pile. They record in their um, in their end. They send back. Um, I mix. And um, so when this whole thing started, I just started working on Uzumaki. It was about the best two months ever. It was actually <laughs> March and April for me were, um, you know, guiltily uh, were just were fantastic. Um, cause it was, it was winter. So it, Montreal and here in Vermont are both just, those are the worst months that there are. It's dreadful cold, snow is piled up and you're in, you're in house anyway. And so I just immersed myself in world building for that show, which I was already just so, um, profoundly, uh, psyched to be, to be working on. And, um, and really just, it, it was just, all Uzumaki all the time <laughs> and just swimming in that is one of my favorite things I've ever done. Um, 
And then and, and, and from there, I just kind of pivoted into the next thing. And I've been solidly uh, busy from, you know, uh, you know, job to job. In, and when I don't have something and right now, what I'm actually looking forward to are the gaps where I don't have something that I'm working on a score because I have, I still make uh, my own records, you know, so I'm working on a number of solo records. I, I finished a couple of them during the summer um, and, uh, and there are several more that I'll be working on over the course of the winter. And um, so this has not really changed much of my, um, the way that I, do things I'll only yeah uh, I only now I really can't I really can't go out and do do an orchestra <laughs> it gives me an excuse <laughs> and uh what about yourself Trevor yeah I mean I was uh they had just finished shooting half of Servant season two and then cut it off so I we were all in the post-production team working throughout like the height of uh, you know, the New York shutdown. Um, and I was working on my dresser with like all my hard drives and everything and one microphone and violin. And it was, you know, I was lucky to be busy doing that uh, for March and April and then got back to my studio and kept working. Um, and we're kind of, you know, slowly creeping up our, our studio to record people, four people at a time, I guess. Um, but yeah, it seems to be getting busy. I mean, cause I think it's probably true for everyone here that it's just such a demand for content that, and we're part of that content providers, right? So <laughs> we're part <laughs> of that equation. <laughs> so uh, they were, everyone's just chomping at the bit to get stuff out there and as soon as they can figure out a way to, re to film it they're going to hire composers to do it so um uh that seems like it's picking up uh yeah, yeah totally uh you know uh it's okay. getting close uh, to the oh go ahead i'm sorry I, didn't mean to interrupt no, I was you. just gonna say one thing is that like sure. um i even though so much of our job is uh you know, in the within the studio walls and and a lot of solitary time. I really have found that um, I'm like, I I personally miss the richness of in person interactions, and um, I I look forward to them coming back because I think um, it's great to, you know, we learn from everything. I kind of feel like, um, you know, I the the more there was something happening which was very exciting, which I think like Trevor saying it's it's coming back now of um, also in the TV world, like using more live instruments um, more often. And uh, I, I just hope and, and kind of trust that that wave will kind of pick up where it left off um, just because it, it brings so much vitality into the process. Even for those of us who do play a zillion things, it's like it, there's, there's something really magical about, um, you know, uh, the, the vibrations in the room when it's not just one person. So um, yeah, for, me, for, for the musicians. I, I think uh, it's a very exciting time for musicians and composers because we're getting to step out of our boxes and figure out things that we usually not figure out. Um, I mean, I've been very, very busy, <laughs> uh, which is a very, very good thing. I mean, I, I, I work on multiple things at the same time. I, I got onto a video game right before COVID hit, um, which was which was awesome. And kind of just same thing as you said, Colin, just picking up another instrument has been one of those things. It's like pick up something else and just learning it. But what's what's been really interesting during COVID for me is the understanding of um, just a fact that how much technology can do for us and just taking advantage of it as much as we can. That's, that's been, that's been the kind of a fun little adventures and figuring, and then, and the musicians are figuring that out as well. Uh, that there's the a lot. And, and the show, I was going to say, and showrunners yeah. and directors much more open to the idea of working remotely. And yeah. even though actually in some ways, nothing has really, that stuff was happening. And we, we do a lot of that with the center, for example, but you see more people open to it, which is great. Yeah. I mean, just the idea that uh, the industry is kind of just expanding out of LA. It's it's been a very interesting thing to look at, uh, with even within the past three four years. But just COVID 
has just made it into, hey, this is actually happening, you know? Totally. You know, we don't have time to get into a lot of the questions. Uh, we have time for one of them. So I'll, I'll just <laughs> read this real quick before we wrap it up. This comes from Chris Dudley. Uh, he wants to know, uh, he said, everyone here is extremely adept at many physical instruments, but what software instruments, if any, have they been digging lately? We only have two minutes. You don't want to just quickly knock this one out. Um, I mean, I, there really are too many to mention because I, I mm -hmm. use a lot of electronic instruments and, and processing. Um, I, I'm uh, recently have been excited about processors that are a little bit more creative and um, in, involve a little bit of, uh, I would say, uh, kind of unexpected randomness and chaos into the processing. So I think Unfiltered Audio is a great company to look at. Um, uh, you know, they also have a synth called Lion, which is pretty rad. Um, I've been digging their stuff. Yeah. I did a bunch of artist presets for, this is a little plug, but uh, Shimmer Verb for Eventide. And like Eventide is one of those companies that was like hanging out and people forgot how cool they are. And actually, yeah, you know, they have a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. And especially have been coming out with more. So take a look at those things. And, and, and. I don't want to take the whole yeah. time. <laughs> Colin, you want to jump in real quick? Me? Yeah, it, it seemed like you were stoked on that one. Oh, no, I was just, I was stoked on, I was, I wanted Renee to <laughs> educate. <laughs> I was right. interested in hearing more. Um, I don't, um, what, um, I don't use a, a whole lot. Well, I don't really use um, any um, uh, software instruments. I use, I mean, I use a fair amount of plugins, and and I use a lot of 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 actual physical synths. Um, I have one. This is not at all what the um, what the uh, <laughs> caller <it> just <laughs> what that guy also caller. Who the how old am I? Um, I have this thing, which is not what they were asking about, but I just got this, what I'm using on, um, and I wish I could show you the, the actual synthesizer of it, but it's um, one of the first, um, there were two different wind synthesizers that were made, analog synths that were made in the, in the mid seventies. And this is one of the, one of the two, and this one only was, they only ever made six of them. And so um yeah so my my geek out moment right this has been the past month learning how to play this um which sounds amazing it's so weird and is just uh lovely to have an analog synth that um that you know falls under my hands the way that they've been doing the thing that they do since i was 10 not on the key i mean i'm i can get around a keyboard but nowhere near how i can get around um uh uh, an instrument set up like a like a sax so it's been it's been lovely to play that's a, a steiner phone um that's been really fun awesome well that wraps up our dissecting horror panel on film scoring for horror i'd like to thank our panelists for such a just entertaining and fun conversation uh as always thank you guys for watching uh thank you to the panelists for taking part and we have an entire week of these dissecting horror panels and so much content come to Dread Central. Uh, we, I think we have three panels this week and we also have Corn Hardy, the director of The Nun, teaching all of you how to carve pumpkins on Halloween day. So join <laughs> us for that. Join us for the other panels. And as always, 